Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. What's up, guys? Xavier Katana here. Such a fun, lighthearted episode with the very warm Michael Marshall Smith, who I would regard as a world class fiction writer. If you've ever wanted to know what is in the mind of an established writer, from the process to writing itself and literally everything in between, Michael has been in the realm of fiction writing for at least a few decades and he has the awards to back up the caliber of his work. So, many thanks to Michael for for making time to be on the show. Make sure you get to his website, michaelmarshallsmith.com to get to his work. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, all at The Human XP. Guys, we survive on listener support. So get to thehumanxp.com slash donate. Buy us a cup of coffee, lunch, or dinner if you're into what we're doing here. It helps us sustain not only the show, but the level of content we can get to you guys on a regular basis. Without much further ado, here is Mr. Michael Marshall Smith. Thank you so much for listening. The human experience is diving into the realms of fiction writing as we speak to our guest, Mr. Michael Marshall Smith. Michael, my good sir, welcome to HXP. Hi, good to be here. Good to talk to you. Michael, you have a wide ranging career in in writing. Can you just give us your background, how you got into writing and who you are for anyone that may be listening that doesn't know, please? Sure. Well, I, I mean, I've been writing, I suspect, for about 20 years. I, I started off in in short fiction. Um, I guess the easiest label for that short fiction would be horror fiction, but it's of a particular sort of type, which is more to do with unease and dread and being unnerved rather than you know, vampires. I mean, I've, I've written about vampires, but I've always tended to come at it from a, um, a kind of a maybe more, more English, um, low key perspective. And so that's, that's what I did for a number of years. And then it occurred to me that I, I should start trying to write novels and sort of just with completely off my own bat, I started writing, um, a novel, which eventually became something called only forward. And to my sort of complete surprise, it ended up being a rather sort of surreal, zany science fiction novel, which is completely different to anything I'd, I'd done before. Um, that was accepted and got published. And so suddenly I was somewhat committed on that path, which I was happy to do because that's what my head was full of at that time. So I wrote a couple more books in that vein, uh, one called Spares, one called One of Us, and then had kind of a switch of genre um, and found myself writing present day kind of conspiracy thrillers mm -hmm. um the first of which was called uh the straw men and right. from then it sort of developed i've sort of ended up almost with these two different strands michael marshall who tends to write the more present day more real world fiction and michael marshall smith who's rather more experimental your first published story the man who drew cats won the British F Fantasy Award in 1991 for Best Short Story. Your novel, only f your first novel, Only Forward, won the August Derleth Award for Best Novel, in mm -hmm. and and then you won the the Philip K. Dick Award, and then you were nominated for the World Fantasy Award in 1995, 1996, and 1997. Wow, mm. you're just covered in trophies. <laughs> for for me, it's it's writing is it, it can be such an ex excruciating thing i mean you just, you're looking at this page and nowadays i mean it, i guess you're using a computer to write and mm. it's just it's getting past that initial just that blank page that is just staring at you and how do you how do you gain inspiration I mean, what is your muse well i mean you know you refer to the sort of some of the early successes and, and they you know they, they were great i mean you know how extraordinary to have your first short story win an award and so on and they you know these are 
these are, these are lovely things and they're, they're good for the ego and they're good for your initial confidence because as you say when you first start out you know you to a degree you have no idea what you're doing I mean to be absolutely honest as a writer you, you may spend the rest of your life feeling you have no idea what you're doing but that's that's part of the writer's job and what writer's process um, and but but a little burst of early confidence is good but to be absolutely honest the you know the job remains the same over the years and over the decades and as to where you get your ideas I you know nobody knows the answer to that question I'm I'm as likely to get an idea wandering around the aisles of Safeway as I am <laughs> to be sitting at my desk or, or concentrating. It's 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 one of the both magical uh, but also slightly scary things that that the initial the initial idea, the spark, the thing that you may end up spending the next year and a half of your life dedicated to, will come from a place that you can't name and you can't there's no map to you just have to trust that sometimes as i say you're wandering around you're looking for capers and suddenly ping oh what if a man was doing this and such and such a thing happened and and off you go and it's that's that's the you know i sometimes think that that being a writer is you know people think of it as a solitary job and it really is a very solitary job but within that it's almost like running a small company that happens to to live with your own in, in your, your own head. head it's like you know a, a startup you know in your head and there's somebody who's responsible for getting the words done there's somebody who's responsible for dealing with the publisher and there is some man or woman who's off down a corridor somewhere no one's quite sure where the office is and every now and then they'll come <laughs> running into the main room and say here's an idea and you look at it and you think nah that's been done or you look at it and you say oh interesting and then the whole company turns around and that's what they're working on for the next year and a half and it's 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 a strange mental process would you say that your first short story the man who drew cats winning the award would you say that that had a positive effect on you or or did it how did it affect your mentality to win a, an award so quickly in your career um, I think I think it, you know, like a lot of like a lot of life events, it 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 had a variety of effects. I mean, the first was obviously confident. You know, the first short story that I'd completed was given an award, um, and you know there were there were concrete positive things that came from that. In that, um, at the award ceremony where I where I was where I got the the thing, um, there was an editor there. Um, and she said congratulations to me as I came down from the podium, sort of thing, and. At that stage, I was halfway through writing this incredibly speculative, oh, well, this will be my trunk novel, but let's give it a try anyway novel. And so I, I sent her a letter, because this was back in the days when you sent letters rather than emails, um, saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I wonder if you'd be interested in a short story collection. Um, and she very politely pointed out to me that short story collections from unknown writers um, are not something that major publishers regard with much enthusiasm. Um, but if I wrote a novel, then she'd like to see it. So that gave me the impetus to finish the novel, and I sent it off to her, and she said, yes, we'll take that. And so, you know, the positive effects were, were very straightforward. An award plus someone agreeing to look at my first novel with a kind eye, and bang, off you go. Of course, there's then... A variety of pressures that come from that as soon as you do something you feel that you need to do it again and if you don't do it again then maybe you're not doing it as well as you were last time and the way the publishing market works particularly now more so now than then is that you can very very rapidly get pigeonholed into niches that are then quite difficult to escape from so there's always you know it's it's there's always more than one thing happening Absolutely. So, Michael, where where would you say your biggest challenge was? I mean, you've been writing for quite some times, and you've you've gone from I, th I think you started out writing comedy. Is that right? A long time ago, I did I did comedy at university. Yes, I went to I went to Cambridge, and I was a member of the Footlights, and had a lot of fun writing writing skits there. And for a couple of years after me and some of the, the guys who had done it at college, we had a couple of um, radio shows for BBC Radio. And we had a TV pilot, and we wrote for other people, and so on. And for a while, that was very much what I was what I was doing. And then I had a kind of epiphany moment where a, a friend of mine i'd been tr badgering him to try and read one of my favorite books a, a book called um lucky jim by kingsley amos and he'd been sort of dragging his feet on that and he's finally said we're in the pub and he said all right i'll read this damn book but you have to read one that i've just read i said okay and he handed it over to me and it was the talisman by stephen king and peter straub mm -hmm. and that just kind of flipped a switch for me um and i, I by the time i got to the end of that book i thought okay this is the kind of thing that not only do I want to write, this is the way I want to spend my life. Wow. And very rapidly, I found that my imagination stopped finding, you know, in those days, if I'd have been wandering around the supermarket, I'd have had an idea for a skit. And then pretty rapidly, it became instead that I've, I'd have an idea for a short story. Um, and so that, I think, was the first thing that sort of dragged me more into that, into that sort of area. 
Okay. You have quite the career. I'm just looking at your biography and you've you've produced for various films. You've done a couple short stories. You've written slash produced. You have writer credits. How? How are you accomplishing this? Well, I, I mean, I, I should stress that a lot of those credits are extremely low and sometimes speculative levels. I mean, my, my, my career in the film and TV industry has, has hardly been stellar. Um, but I think you know, in, in the old day, and this is something that's increasingly true um, of the job or the lifestyle or the life of being a writer, which is that <clears throat> it's not as simple as it used to be. It used to be that there would be a certain amount of money around. And yes, you could be one of the super best sellers, but there was also a strong mid list, um, a place where people, you know, wrote books in a timely fashion year after year, and they'd be paid just about enough and they'd have enough of a career. That mid list hit has pretty much disappeared in publishing these days. There are now, publishers tend to be very focused upon either the guaranteed bestsellers, the people who, you know, whack it out of the park year after year after year, partly because there's a there's a sitting waiting audience that just sort of perpetuates that situation. And so they're either looking for those or they're looking for the newbies, the people who've, who've wandered in with, you know, a very interesting first book that mm-hmm. they can then just, you know, do something with. The idea of people who are, producing interesting stuff year after year after year that's for the time being and this this is i hope cyclic um or something that that will move on from but for the time being that that area of the market has been quite squeezed out and so what a lot of writers are finding is that you need to spread around a bit you need to you need to try and do a little bit of screenwriting you need to try and do a little bit of stuff on the web you need to it's a it's a portmanteau career rather than just being the the one straight thing and i think a lot of writers also find that i mean i've written i guess I think it must be about 90 short stories now. And there are some ideas that come to me, and they're a short story. They're, they're not going to be a novel, and they, they don't feel like there should be a script. They're going to be a story. And you know, part of the job is trying to recognize what's the best home, what's the best shape for these, sto- for, for these ideas that come to you. Um, and so that's why there tends to be a little bit of a variety within people's careers, because they're making these sort of strategic choices. What do I do? This is not a book, so what do I do with it? And I'm, mm. I've always been comfortable writing in, the, in those different formats. And so I, I, I try to keep doing it. Intrig- I'm, and I find this process intriguing. So your first, after your first successful story, you became good friends with a variety of different writers and editors. How did, how did having that level of con- contact and interaction, how did that benefit your writing and your kind of your career and, and the way you moved forward? Well, I think I think it benefits on a couple of levels. I mean, I started hanging out with with a, <clears throat> a small coterie of sort of English short story writers who've been nicknamed the Miserablists because at that stage, basically, we're all, you know, single guys in our mid twenties living in in rainy London, writing, to be honest, quite <laughs> miserable short stories, often <laughs> often influenced by people like you know Ramsay Campbell. So you know, eerie little tales, generally about sort of you know single men or women um, who'd been done wrong by their partner and whose life was going to you know going to hell. Um, and what was good about that is that, you know, it is, it is a very solitary task. And there are days when you just think, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Is anybody going to care? And to occasionally, you know, it's partly having other people re- read your stuff, but it's pass. It's also in some ways, more importantly, just having some peers and some like-minded people to hang out with. I mean, particularly with horror writers, you get a bunch of horror writers in a pub, you'll notice two things. One, they never talk about writing. And Mm -hmm. two, it'll be the most fun you've ever had because they tend to be extremely lighthearted people. You know, I think people think of horror writers as these really grim, dark, gothic people. But they never are. They tend to be just just people who like a beer and like like a chat. Um, And so if you're trying to forge a fairly solitary lifestyle as a writer, then having that recourse from people who do, to spend some time with people who do understand the kind of thing you're doing is important. But I think also from a more career and commercial point of view it's also it's like when, when people ask me you know how do i become a writer what are the early steps particularly in genre fiction mm-hmm. i think the most important thing you can do is to go to some good conventions because partly you'll meet like-minded people partly also in the bar you may meet the the woman or man who is going to be the person who's six months from now is putting together an anthology on a particular topic and if they've met you and if they've read your other stuff then they are more likely to look with favor upon something that you submit. And so, you know, people meeting people like Ellen Dallow or in particular, you know, man who's, you know, gone on to be, you know, my best friend, Stephen Jones, who's an absolute titan in the, in the, the figure of genre fiction. There's no question that meeting these people and 
being inspired by them and you know having them give you confidence and support uh, it's it's desperately important particularly in the early stages when you were writing your own fiction you were working as a graphic designer and uh you were in the corporate world earning a living mm. i mean how did how did your writing routine kind of vary from back then and where you are now for earning a living as a, a writer now because I, can, I imagine that writing books when you're starting out can't pay very well and it, I mean it must be difficult to earn a living as as a writer it is I mean I, I you know short stories pay next to nothing to be absolutely honest for a long time that's that's what I was doing I mean I you know you write short stories partly for the love of it you know if you like the form I mean I say I think there are certain ideas in certain genre and you know, dark fiction, I think, is definitely one of them where a lot of the best work is actually done in the short story form. So there's many reasons to love it for its own sake, but it's also a way of of, of basically refining your craft, getting a sense of what kind of writer you are, what kind of thing you're interested in, what your voice on the page is going to sound like. But mm-hmm. you're right, they, you know, you, 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 they won't buy you a cup of coffee, to be absolutely honest. Um, <laughs> and in terms of working as a graphic designer, I was a kind of fake graphic designer. I... I I got a day job because I needed one. Um, I had by that point already made the decision that actually I was going to try to be a writer, so I just needed to find something to do. And I was working for this company. And this is back in the days when all graphic design was was you know some weird magical process where you gave the words to somebody, they took them off, they made bromides out of it, they were cut up, they were cut back. And my father, who was an academic, happened to get a deal on a on a very early um, Macintosh and. I basically took that over from him and, and rapidly realized that, you know, the desktop publishing revolution was actually going to change everything. And so I kind of sideswiped into saying, okay, all this stuff, which is taking you days at a time, I can do this in half an hour. And so I basically kind of blagged, as we say in England, my, myself a, a semi-career as a graphic designer because, you know, I can, I could copy stuff. And that basically was, was a way I earned a living. I also wrote corporate videos um which are you know basically training videos for corporate co- so basically i was just finding a way of using my my limited skills to to pay the bills while i while i wrote um and i didn't actually go full time as a writer for quite a long I, until after i think it was just before my second book came out because i lucked into an opportunity to do a massive sort of screenwriting job which was converting clive barker's uh, weave world into a, a eight part TV series, which is still not seen in the light of day, 20 years <laughs> later, but it was enough that I, I, I took the plunge and said, okay, I'm getting just about enough money here that I'm going to call myself a writer and go with it. And that's, that's basically what happened. Wow. Yeah. It's intriguing. Is there a certain type of genre or what is your opinion on genres as a whole? Do you find them to be restrictive or do you find that when you pick a specific genre that it helps do certain genres help books sell better i think the, i think the genre issue is a, is a very naughty one and you, and you talk to writers and they all have very different takes on it sometimes it can be extremely helpful it depends what genre you're in crime for example crime or mystery is a very marketable profitable reputable genre if you say that you're a crime writer then people go oh, okay you write those mysteries they're very successful i like mysteries it's you know that that can be that can be a great help. Um, there are certain other genres. If you say you're a science fiction writer, then people go, oh, that's kind of nerdy. I'm sure you know some of those you know people with glasses you know might might enjoy that, but it doesn't sound like my kind of thing. Although having said that, they will then happily watch um, science fiction material in the cinema, but they don't think that it's the kind of thing they want to read. And at the very bottom of the pile is you, know, you kind of almost don't want to say you're a horror writer because people will just dismiss that as the sort of, you know, it's the, it's the true ghetto fiction, despite mm-hmm. the fact that, you know, some of the great, I, you know, I, I think it's unfortunate in some ways that Stephen King has spent his whole time writing horror subjects because I think he's a pro stylist. He's ex- extremely good. There are other writers like, you know, Thomas Ligotti or Laird Barron or Shirley Jackson or Peter Straub who are, who are beautiful prose writers and who write at least as tellingly about the human condition as anybody else, but because they're perceived as horror writers, there's a kind of negative cachet about those genres. And so a lot of writers can find that they find themselves backed into a sort of genre position that's hard for them to escape. Um, and that can be unfortunate, particularly if it happens to be a genre that's that's out of fashion at the time. So I'm a proud genre writer. I'm very happy to, to write in a variety of genres. I've written horror, I've written science fiction, I've written crime, I've written serial killer novels. And that's not because I don't know what the hell I'm doing, or maybe it is, I don't know. But it's there's something about each of these different fields that appeals. And I kind of don't see why 
I should limit myself. It's a bit like saying to a painter, okay, great, you have to only use blues for the rest of your life. And it's like, well, there's a lot you can do with blue, right. but I'd like yeah. access to some of the other some of the other colors. And, I, and you know, as, as the best genre fiction writers demonstrate, there's absolutely no reason why you can't outright anybody in sort of pure literary fiction. Plus, you get to have monsters and cool stuff and a sense of wonder and, and all that other stuff. So for me, it's getting the best of both worlds, but you have to be aware that is a career decision. Yeah, absolutely. I, Michael, when you're when you're coming up with characters for your your novels, your book, do they reflect people that you encounter in your real in your life or I mean is this just purely imaginational thinking? Yeah, I, mean, they, how, I, how I never do the the sort of Romana Clef reflection of people in real life. It's just never it's just never to, to be absolutely honest, characters come to me. I am um, I don't make them up. The the way a book tends to start for me is that I will have a basic idea. It'll be a sort of, oh, what, what if? Or wouldn't it be weird if? Or uh, wouldn't it be horrible if? Um, and that tends to be the basic idea. And then around that, to a degree outside my control, initially, some possible environments and events will start to accrete in my mind. And with that will come some characters. Um, often a sort of sense of voice. And then there'll be a couple of core people um, who basically just arrive in my head and say, okay, well, I'm part of this thing. Um, I'm going to be one of the people who are involved in this situation and maybe driving it. And that tends to be the initial kit that I'm delivered with by whoever it is who works off down the corridor in the, in the you know novel writing startup business. Then comes the bit where you have to say, okay, if this looks like what I'm going to be doing next, what else do I need? And you'll say, well, I probably need a character who's a bit like that. Actually, I probably need to involve this kind of environmental situation. This kind of event will probably need to happen. And that's when you start to make some sort of conscious decisions as opposed to just accepting what it is that your back brain has handed to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's the point at which a lot of grown-up authors would sit down and say, okay, he was a whack and great sheet of paper. I'm now going to rigorously plan this out so that I have everything worked out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am unfortunately not a grown-up writer. I still um, tend to prefer or I'm constrained to work in a far more sort of free form. Okay, I've got a sense of what's happening here, a sense of where I'm going. Let's just sit down and see what happens. Um, it's my preferred way of working. I've tried the other way once or twice, and it's been okay. But for me, the journey, the, the, the walk along the path is going to be at least as interesting as any other part of the process. And you never know quite how you're going to get to where you want to go. Um, and so I tend to I tend to work that way, which can lead to some very very long, dark periods where you're lost and you have no idea where you're going next. But it seems to be something I don't have a choice over. Is there, is there something that you have kind of relied on, or is kind of your secret that no one really knows about? That maybe well, I wouldn't tell you if there for... was one. Would I? If it's going to be a secret, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just me and you. Um, I mean, is there is there something that you kind of go to that maybe is a little bit unusual, or just something noteworthy that we could share with the people listening that? may inspire them into, you know, kind of finding their own, their own way. I think yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I think, you know, what everybody, including, including career writers are hoping for is that kind of the magic bullet, the silver bullet that makes it, that makes it easier. The, the guaranteed, the guaranteed technique, the guaranteed source of inspiration, the guaranteed way of working. And I don't have one, I'm afraid I'm just going to come right out there and say that. I think, <laughs> I think part of it is probably because, <clears throat> there, you know, there are two ways of approaching writing, um, and neither of them is necessarily better than the other. There is a, a degree to which you can just see it as a sort of journeyman thing, almost like a pulp writer, and you say, okay, I'm good at producing stories, and I'm just going to churn these things out, and it almost stays separate from yourself or your being. Or you can write from your own life and have a very personal relationship with what it is that you're writing. I think a lot of the best writers tend to be of that camp, um, mm -hmm. and I think if there is a if there is a secret, um, and this is a very interesting question, it's, it's not one I've actually sort of approached like that. So if I falter a bit, it's because I'm actually thinking in real time, okay. which, I, yeah. which I which I try not to do. Um, I think it is it's there are certain things that you need to do if you want to be a writer. You need to write, obviously, and you need to read. If you don't do those two things, it simply won't happen. 
Um, people who think that they can write novels without having some awareness of what's been written in the field, both now and in the past, without refreshing themselves. It's, you know, the, the, the writing muscle is very close in the mind to the reading muscle. And by reading you, you help exercise the writing muscle. So I think that's, that's deeply important. You also need to put yourself in a position where, where you, you realize that you, you need to be, you need to be a little bit kind to yourself and you need to sort of understand that it's not always going to be easy. And there are certain pressures you can put yourself under, which are simply not going to help you. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I don't know where you stand on foul language on the show, but there's a, um, there's a, you're fine. Yeah, okay, you good. Can... I, okay. A stream of cursing is about to come in. No, uh, there was a, <laughs> there's a, a Hemingway quote, which I, I've turned down ages ago, but I actually re relearned a year or two ago. And he said, um, the first draft of everything is shit. Yeah. And that has been one of the most useful quotes that I've sort of relearned recently because a lot of people put themselves, particularly when they're writing a first book, under a huge amount of pressure to produce perfection or something like it. And that'll kill the novel Stone Dead and it'll kill you and it won't get finished. If you accept the fact that it is a, it's a process, that, that I think is more than anything else the key so-called insight that I have, which is that writing is not an event, it's a process. And you will, it will take you a while to come up with an idea. It'll take you a while to get to the stage where you're, you're ready to write it. You will then write a first draft, which will almost certainly be shit. And if you reassure yourself of that and say, not only is this not my, it's not my problem, this is what everybody does. I'm racking through a first draft or something right now, and this is my 14th novel or something, and two or three times a day I said, it doesn't matter, just get it down. It doesn't matter if it's crap, just get this first draft down. Because until you've got a first draft, you don't actually know what it is that you're writing. Then you go back. And so it's the, it is that process thing. And, you know, whatever works is, is the other thing. You've got to find your own individual process. It may be that working in a coffee shop works for you. It may be that music on the background works. It may be you need absolute silence. It may be that handwriting is a more visceral way of doing it for you. And that even though it takes longer and is more tiring, it's just you, you're able to access your inner whatever it is more securely that way. So, sorry, there's a very long-winded answer to, non-answer to your question. Okay. But I think respecting the fact that it's a process and taking the time to discover what yours is that I think rather than thinking, Oh, this guy on the web said you have to do it this way or someone else implies that the only way to get published is that way. There may be useful nuggets to be gleaned there, but you also have to understand that it's this, these are somebody else's way and you probably won't be secure in what you're doing until you found your own. So kind of finding your own process and also understanding that whatever you release, the first draft is not going to be perfect yeah. and removing that, that sense of needing to be perfect mm -hmm. right away, that pressure, moving that, removing that pressure away, that, that tends to help. Absolutely. I mean, because, you know, removing barriers is part of the process, um, not feeling that you have to write to any particular genre, not worrying too much about the audience to start off with, not worrying about whether or not your sentences are perfect. I mean, there's a time for it. And, you know, again, later parts of the process, I mean, I, I have a particular bugbear about word doubling. I, I don't want to see the same word appearing more than once in a paragraph, I mean, unless they're words like and or the. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can get bogged down in just making sure that my prose is up to a standard that I, I, I hope to aspire to. And so th there's a time for that. But like anything else in life, you can often feel that you're very hemmed in by by barriers. Um, and some of those are very real. Uh, but some of those will be ones that for sometimes good reasons, sometimes bad reasons, you place there yourself. And the fewer barriers you can put between you and, you know, the empty page wants to be filled. Voids want mm. to be filled. Nature mm. abhors a vacuum. It's there waiting. You mm. just have to get the barriers out of the way. Yeah, wow, that's very profound. So something, something, Michael, that you do is you shift between these two names. You mm -hmm. shift between using Michael Marshall Smith and then just Michael Marshall. What prompted this modified name uh, idea, and how, and in what ways would you feel that that you know writing under these these separate names affect your writing? Well, it's, I mean, the, the, the truth for to that is that it was initially not my decision. I mean, basically, I'd written dark, you know, horror-ish fiction, short fiction for a number of years under the name Michael Marshall Smith. I then wrote um, my first book, Only Forward, which, as I say, is set in the future, therefore was theoretically science fiction, although it's, it's kind of surreal and it has a lot of darkness in it. 
didn't seem any big deal for me because as far as I was concerned, it was all just speculative, weird fiction that had a, a fairly similar voice going through it. But then after writing two more of books of that type, Spares and One of Us, <clears throat> I'd always been fascinated by the idea of, by the phenomenon of serial killers. And I thought I had a take on it along the lines that, you know, we tend to, as you know, as we see so often in life, we tend to ring fence certain types of behavior and say, okay, that's not us. This is unrelenting evil that we cannot understand. And that's quite a comforting way of approaching the world. But it seemed to me that serial killing actually represented a, the far extreme of a kind of neurotic behavior that we're all to one degree or another prey to. And I read up, I spent a lot of time, and this was sort of a hobby because I was writing the other fiction at the time, reading a lot around the area of serial killers and, and becoming more and more convinced that actually they weren't that different. I mean, in some ways they horrifically are, and this is not a defense of serial killers in any way, but... Anyway, I felt I had a take on it um, and eventually thought, okay, I'm going to write this. So I wrote a book called The Straw Men, um, which initially had some fantastical elements in it, but in the end wound up being a conspiracy-led modern-day mystery novel that had quite a different... I mean, the voice was similar, but the texture was different, partly because it was less human than the previously been in before, because I thought, mm -hmm. you know, serial killers, they're not funny. Let's not, let's, you know, rack down the jokes. Um, and it wasn't said in the future because I thought, you know, I want to try and make a point here. If I set this in the future, that could be distancing. So let's set it in the present day. By the way, I ended up with a novel that was actually, you know, qualitatively quite different in some ways to a publisher's eyes. And they looked at this and they said, seriously, well, hang on, you write the science fiction stuff with the jokes and the talking fridges. What's this? <laughs> um, but they they liked it enough and felt it had enough potential that they were prepared to you know publish it as my next novel and it's probably actually strawman has been the most successful thing i ever did or i've done so far but they said we're going to have a problem here because readers come to you expecting one type of thing and you've handed them something which is completely not that type of thing right. also there may be a new audience out there who who didn't want the strange science fiction but will be up for this kind of thing you know because it wasn't that long after the sort of the, the big Thomas Harris, I forget what it's called, the, the fourth one of those. Um, and so my American publisher said, how about we, we do some sort of name change just to signal to people? And I came up with the idea of saying, okay, well, I'm not going to change it to something completely different because that would be weird to me. How about I just lop off the Smith? Uh, and they said, okay, we'll, we'll go with it. And, and at the time, I sort of, because there's a, you know, I'm sure you're aware of the, the sadly deceased you know, British writer, Ian Banks, who, who wrote more general fiction under Ian Banks and then used Ian M. Banks for um, uh, for speculative science fiction or maybe the other way around. Um, and I thought, okay, there's a precedent there. Maybe you can have two strands. So you write the very weird speculative cross-genre stuff under Michael Marshall Smith and something that is a little bit more grounded in very commercial fiction you write under under Michael Marshall. And that kind of made sense to me. And I wrote, I wrote two more books in the Straw Men trilogy. But unfortunately, I found that... that the the person in the back room of the startup kept coming with weirder and weirder ideas each time. Um, and so the Michael Marshall books started slewing slightly more back towards Michael Marshall Smith material, not in terms of science fiction, but in terms of the maybe the more horror and easy supernatural um, short stories. And so in the end, it hasn't worked especially well because I haven't kept the distinction very clear, partly because the distinction just simply isn't very clear in my head um it's possible that life would have been a lot simpler if i'd have, if I'd have kept that distinction clear but i don't like genres i don't i don't particularly believe in them i think there's a there's a sense of wonder and a, and a yeah i think all of us however much we may pretend otherwise on a day-to-day -day basis know that there's something else going on some people put that into a religion box. Some people put it into a spirituality box. Some people put it into a Hillary's emails box, you know, but there's this sense that <laughs> behind the veil, there is some dread truth that we're not being told. And the job of, for me, of fiction is to every now and then just not throw the door wide, but open the door and say, you know, reality doesn't stop where the walls of our house stops. There's stuff outside the window and we know it's there. We know that sometimes we think that we know the phone's going to ring just before it rings. We have our little superstitious rituals before we do something or other. There are things that make us feel more comfortable in life. There are things that make us feel uncomfortable in life. And many of these are not rational. We are open to this. 
And I'm, I'm mistrustful of any sort of body of thought or any type of fiction which completely shuts the door on that. And so yeah. that's why I've tended to end up sort of messing up the consensual reality distinction because I, I basically don't believe in it. Yeah, that's a perfect segue actually into my next question, which is, you know, you when you were growing up, you had an interest in Zen and reading philosophy at your university, Colin Wilson, Gurdjieff, uh, among others. Hey, do you still carry this interest in philosophy? And are you influenced by the esoteric metaphysical side of, of things? I can be. I mean, I think I, I think in, in adolescence and and while I was at college, yeah, I did I did study um, uh, philosophy at, at, at Cambridge. Um, I found, you know, particularly Colin Wilson. Colin Wilson was a huge eye opener to me because, you know, he's a, he's a he's a his, his prose is good. He's a he was a very wide ranging, you know, writer in terms of subjects and a great sort of aggregator of and and curator of of, of different thoughts. And you know, he wrote a lot of he wrote of slightly dubious nonsense as a lot of these people do, but he was deeply inspirational in terms of sort of saying. Think about the world this way. It doesn't even matter to a degree whether it's true. Um, you know, I often find this now, you know, because I, I, I remain interested in, in 14 material and, and conspiracy stuff and that kind of thing. And to a degree, you know, truth is a very movable feast. Um, and very often things that are regarded as being truth, and you see this in science too, whatever it may claim to the contrary, um, it'll, okay, here is, here is the status quo in terms of what we believe about this subject. And that is the truth. And anyone who says, suggests otherwise is wrong. And then 10 years down the line, it'll be, oh, but we found out this other thing, so it turns out that was all wrong. But this new thing is completely right, and anything else you say is wrong. And so that's anybody who thought that does that and isn't open to the idea that actually wrongness probably you know, outranks in importance rightness, because it's often wrongness that'll lead us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I got from a lot of those sort of thoughts and ways of just regarding the human, the human beast and the human mind as being somewhat more interesting than was often pretended. I think I think that is something that has absolutely stayed with me. And in the last couple of years, for a variety of reasons, I've ended up, you know, finally getting re around to reading some Jung and some of his sort of interpreters in a way that I can't believe I never really had before. But maybe, you know, and again, it's going to sound a little bit esoteric, but maybe, you know, certain things come to you at the right time when, when your life is ready, when you are ready to receive them. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm not a particularly woo-woo, I'm not a particularly hippie person in general, but I... I, I and prepared to think that there are currents in our life. There is there is development that happens within something that might as well be called a soul, and that every now and then life will bring you up to certain points and make you realise things about yourself. And that's when you're you should be open to the broader ways of trying to explain them rather rather than trying to stuff them into very small boxes. So yeah, I'm still. I'm still interested in that kind of stuff. And I think that in a previous interview, you you said that one of your biggest influences or one of your most influential things was serendipity. And you mm. you mentioned an example in your story, One of Us began to take form via a number of coincidences that yeah. emerged in your life at that time. What were those coincidences? Has this happened to you before or did this it, it, just it, happen? It often, it's, it's, a process, it's a process that I... And again, this is just one of your, you know, it relates back to what I was saying in terms of particular process. I mean, with one of us, it was a particular event happened, a particular song happened to be, and, you know, because one of us happened to be a big song at that time in the in the UK, the Jane Osborne song. And very often, I, what I try to do when I'm at the beginning of a book and throughout, but particularly at the beginning of the book, is put myself into what I kind of think of as flypaper mode, because there comes a point where an idea has become sufficiently sort of real to me that... In a way, it kind of influences my perception of the world, not in some you know bizarre way, but it's just my head is sufficiently geared towards that one idea that it's it's like the 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 white van. I mean, I'm sure you probably call it something else, but the or the white car. You buy a white car, suddenly you see four times as many white cars on the road because your perception has shifted. I mean, that's one that thing. And once an idea gets to a certain point in your head, I think you then actually semi-objectively start seeing the world differently you you start seeing things that fit in with the idea that you've that, you, that you're starting to sort of inculcate in your head it's like it's like a your consciousness is a lens as you start looking through a, a lens filtered by any certain thing you start to see more and more and more of that Exactly, and I think I think it's a it may be a semantic decision or not semantic, but it's it's 
in terms of does the world actually change or does your perception of the world change? And so, you know, are coincidences something that are real or a coincidence something that is that is a function of the way that you're perceiving the world? And to be honest, it doesn't really matter. But either is just as interesting as a phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and so I do tend to find that that serendipity or coincidence or me simply perceiving the world slightly differently because of a shift in perception or a shift in the direction that my inner self is facing does tend to be quite a, a strong impetus to some of the initial writing uh, process. The, th- the reality of, <clears throat> of being a writer, unfortunately, is that you will then sometimes have to, to rein that back in. Because, you know, I found sometimes with books, um, I mean, Strawman is, for example, is a, <coughs> excuse me, a classic example of this because it, you know, it's basically a serial killer novel. But what, in addition to the the things that I was talking about earlier, the sort of being interested in, you know, the the psychological underpinnings of of that phenomena, I I sort of was just addressing the question of, you know, why did humankind start farming? Mm-hmm. And that it was a question that occurred to me, and it's, it's one of these questions that people have still not quite got to the bottom of because initially. It seems counterproductive because it, it led to a lack of freedom. There was, there was more disease because we were living together. There was a, there was a massive um, reduction in the variety of our diet. Um, there are a number of things that seem actually to be counterproductive to, to the quality of human life. And so no one's quite got their head around why that changed happened. And again, that, that became something that I was interested in. And initially, in the first draft of Strawman, there was a huge chunk of random esoteric speculation about this. And then you go to the second draft and you think, okay, Michael, this is very interesting to you, but nobody else gives a damn. And it's stopping the plot moving forward. And what was initially two chapters got boiled down in the end to, I think, to less than a page. Um, so you've, you know, sometimes the serendipitous things that actually get you to write the thing, you have to then, you know, kill your babies and look back and say, that was great. It's great that those steps got <laughs> you there, but it turns out there was an elevator around the corner. So the readers are going to want to go up that way. Wow. It's fascinating kind of hearing you discuss your, the way you've developed your writing style, what influences it and what kind of inspires it. Another thing that you seem to be kind of big into is, is photography. When, I mean, when did you discover your enthusiasm for taking pictures? And I mean, something that you say on your in your on your shop is that the pictures I create are influencing my writing and the writing influences further images these two things seem to flow together for you Mm. how do they I mean where when did you first start and and how do they flow together well I mean I've I've always been you know interested in the visual I mean I think if my life had gone slightly differently I probably would have ended up maybe being either an artist or an architect rather than a writer because that's something that I've always you know I had a I had interest in those subjects well before I actually considered being a writer um, and something that I find when I'm writing is that I know that I'm not doing my best work or I know I'm not ready to write unless I have an absolutely, unless I can visualize the environment as clearly as I can visualize real life environments. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of internal visionary process, I suppose, I don't mean visionary, I mean having a vision uh, has always been important. And I, you know, way back in the day, I used to enjoy taking photographs and so on. The stuff that I'm doing in the moment is is a kind of new development over the last couple of years where I just found that there were certain types of ideas and emotions and and atmospheres and I don't know, beats of beats of soul, if that doesn't sound too too strange, that were just easier for me to express in a visual way than they were in a in a in a written way um and that is something that you know i've ended up getting a great deal of <clears throat> i don't know what pleasure is the word but um it's something that has become you know very much a part of my life over the last couple of years and yes there, there's definitely a a kind of symbiotic relationship between the writing and the images sometimes thoughts that are going into my head that I don't have any other particular way of expressing or haven't found any other way of expressing, I find I can express in an image. And sometimes I will see something and, and have a thought about that and find that that influences the writing. Um, and again, maybe this you know, partly relates back to the idea of process, whatever it is that keeps your inner motor purring, whatever it is that keeps your, your sort of self feeling that is engaging with the world and with things that you, you feel you need to express and so on. I think whatever works, whatever it is that, that keeps you that keeps you working, that keeps you thinking, that keeps you feeling things, these you know, for I, th- I think that's that's very important. I think that's you know that and that's part of the sort of role that it has in my life at the moment. Yeah. And I mean you you also 
you know, along with kind of sharing your, your pictures on Instagram, you also created a website to to get artists to share mm. their work. I, how do you pronounce B-I-I-T? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's something that I want to work on a little bit more. I, I started that about a year or so ago, and unfortunately, because of work pressures, I haven't done as much of that where I should, but it's something I'd, I'd really like to to, <clears throat> to move forward. It's spelled B-I-I-T dot space. I, I just pronounce it bit space because otherwise it's going to be bead space or some, some, some sort of weird thing um i mean it's called b-i-i-t space because it came from a, a quote from i think is it thomas berger who basically said you know why do you uh why do you um there's a i forget who it was some famous mountaineer who was said you know why do you climb mountains and he said because it's there and i think it was thomas berger who was asked the question why, why do you write and he said well because it isn't there and oh, wow. I, you know that is part of the, i think the, the part of the creative process you, you feel something you see something that isn't there and that that desire or almost need to take this thing which has a, a strong reality to you within your head and, and make it concrete um, is is a big part of the creative process. And something I just found when, you know, I was I was putting up the pictures on on Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter for, you know, for my own reasons, for my own satisfaction, I guess, to a degree. Um, and I found that um, that people were responding to them. Sometimes, you know, people were were putting on captions for ones that I hadn't put on captions for. And then a couple of people actually got in touch with me, and they'd written, you know, short pieces, and in some cases, quite long short stories, which which were basically riffing off the picture that I put up. And I thought, well, that's that's quite interesting because, you know, again, you know, right back at the beginning of, of when we were chatting, you say, where do ideas come from? And ideas can come from anywhere from the island Safeway or from some picture that some random guy put up on Instagram and that that lights a tiny spark in your head and, and out comes a piece of fiction. And I found it interesting and I thought, well, you know, these people have written these things. It'd be nice for them to be read by people. So I created this site. And because, you know, the, 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 the creative process, the writing process can sometimes be hard. People need feedback. It's nice for people to get feedback. And it's also nice if there's anything that can help people in terms of saying, okay, well, maybe one of these images will help you to put them up. And so that's what I started doing with the website. And it, you know, there's, there's 40 or 50 pieces up there now where, and it's not just my pictures. There's a couple of other people who are contributing pictures now. And there's also some music. There's a couple of, I mean, I, Way back in the day, I used to do a bit of music and so on, sort of um, sort of derivative soundtrack type stuff. So I put up those, and a, a, a musician friend of mine called uh, Suzanne Barbieri in the UK has put up some stuff. And as I say, it's I really want to sort of take this to a kind of phase two, but it needs it needs far more more sophisticated software to do it, and it needs more more time for me. So when I'm finished this this new book that I'm writing, I'm hoping to give that a little bit more time. Definitely does sound interesting to to have you kind of leading these these other writers and picture takers and 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 starting that up. So Michael, I have kind of a, a funny interesting story for you. I I happen to be part of this it's it's a group of about 40 people. We're friends and we just kind of have like a Facebook group that we kind of just hang out in. One day a few weeks ago, a month ago, I asked a question to this group of friends. I asked who who in your life, who who is someone that has completely changed the way you think and your life uh, and someone that is alive that I can interview? And your name came up. <laughs> and uh, the person who mentioned your name, uh, her name is Louise. Mm -hmm. Louise has a few questions for you. She wants to know, has your relationship with writing changed over the years? Yeah, well, a, hi, Louise, if you're listening, that's an incredibly nice thing to hear, and, and thank you. Uh, yes, it has changed. Um, I mean, a sort of sub-question that you asked earlier that I somehow wandered away from um, was how the process of writing has changed. When I was first doing the graphic design stuff and so on, when you first start writing, it's it's a kind of romantic quest. It's you versus the world. It's It's something that nobody else knows or believes you can do and to be absolutely honest you don't know or, or believe that you can do either and there's you know you, you'll be doing some other job to to pay for your time and to pay for the stuff that you need and there is a real sort of you know you against the world sort of feeling about it and so at that time i i you know i had a full-time job and i was i would get back from it and i would write until two o'clock in the morning um and i would write all all day at the weekends um, and it had that sort of feeling about it. And I always actually felt that I did a lot of my best work at about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the evening because the world was quiet. Nobody's phoning yeah. you up. There's no pressures. It's just you in a quiet room, darkness outside. And that always used to be my my best time. Um, you know, cut to 20 years later, there are 
evening meals to be cooked. There is homework to be supervised. Um, I have been a professional writer for for two decades. Um, that doesn't work anymore. That that that's that kind of process has had to evolve. So on two levels, one, the way in which you do it changes because the way, because of the way one's life circumstances change, but also it stops being a solitary quest and it starts being a job. Um, you have deadlines, you have expectations from readers and publishers, you have expectations which you set yourself in terms of saying, okay, well, that's not quite good enough, or hang on a minute, that's just the same thing again. Shouldn't you be still evolving? Shouldn't you be doing something different? Shouldn't this... So it becomes, on the one hand, it becomes easier because you've done it for a long time. On the other hand, it becomes harder because you've done it for a long time. Um, so yeah, difficult question. Yeah. She, Louise also wants to know, do you enjoy the process of, of writing? Have you ever felt uninspired to write? And if so, what did you do to kind of re-inspire yourself? There are many, 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 many occasions on which I felt uninspired, uh, uninspired to write. There are many, many, many occasions on which I wish I had any other job in the world. Mm. It's, you know, as anyone who's tried to do it, it's not, it's not... It's not easy, and sometimes it's a life sentence too. I mean, there's a great uh, quote from the screenwriter Lawrence Kasdan who says, "You know, being a writer is like having homework every night for the rest of your life," and that's that's true. There is a, there, it picks at you. It says, "Yeah, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. Should be doing this." It's not something you can sort of take time off from, and that will sometimes wear you down. And having said which, there are days where I will sit down and I will then look up four hours later and have no idea what happened and find that I wrote 2000 words. And that those, those are, those are semi magical times. And it's a bit where on those afternoons or even those half hours where stuff just comes out of the back of your head and you think, oh, I have no idea where this is coming from, but it seems to be working. So I'll just keep typing it down while, while it's still happening. Those are, those are great, you know, that you feel quite integrated as a as a person you feel you're doing something that's that's distinctively you those are those are great moments um i would say they are numbered in in me approximately 50 to 1 by the times when it's a struggle and it's uninspired and during those periods you have to do two things one remember that you know being a being a quotes artist is a job and Mm -hmm. if you wait for inspiration then it'll never happen and, you know, it's, it's uh, again, there's a, there's a great Thurber quote about, you know, the old newspaperman's quote says, I don't want it perfect, I want it Tuesday. And a lot of being a writer is doing that. You just need to get the stuff down and then worry mm-hmm. later about whether it's any good. And then the other part of it is to, again, refer back to something I said earlier, discovering your process, discovering the fact that there will be days when you get no words done. But if you go out and you walk around the street And you have that half inkling that says, oh, maybe I need to do this. That's worth a day in which you write 3,000 words. Because ultimately piecing together those sort of insights will be what gets the job done. You know, cranking out words, that shouldn't be hard. If cranking out words is hard, then you might want to consider another job. But it's chasing those will-o'-the-wisp ideas and the internal man management. That's, That's the stuff that you need to sort of learn about yourself. Louise also, she says that she's read that you don't like to discuss an idea, novel or story before it's finished. Yes. So how, how do you, how do you choose the ideas that you are going to work on? Uh, Yeah, it's true. I have an almost pathological, definitely superstitious fear of discussing an idea beforehand. To me, it always feels, it's almost like telling the punchline of a joke before you've, before you've told the other bits. It's partly that. And it's Mm -hmm. partly because... To a possibly excessive degree, I do get sort of rather invested emotionally and personally in the stuff that I write. I don't, for all I've just said about it being a job, I don't, you know, at heart feel like that. In fact, you know, each each of the things I've written, a lot of me goes into them, and so they do feel extremely personal. And, and despite the fact that you know, I splurge out all the stuff on, on in, into books, I'm actually extremely private, rather rather introverted, and I don't let this stuff out. Um, just by saying it, it if it's if it's going to come out, I need to have written it and spent a lot of time with it and sort of got it to the point where I think, okay, this is okay. This is worth reading. This is, I feel that I've said the thing that I wanted to say. And so that's the, that's the process that I personally need to go through. Publishers hate this because what they want before you start, and certainly when they're buying a new book or a new slate of books, is they want to be told what they're getting. 
And so there is that process where you have to write down a proposal for books. Um, and that that is one of my least favorite parts of the whole thing because it feels like I'm just sort of, you know, it feels like I'm walking naked down the street at that stage. And that's something that I do not enjoy doing. Um, so in terms of the, the, the further bit of the question is, it's a, it's a gut feeling with ideas. For me, what I tend to do is if I think I've got an idea for a novel, I don't write it down. I have huge files of other stuff, little snatches of random dialogue, observations, you know, s sketches of places, ideas for, for little things. But if I think, oh, that might be a novel idea, I deliberately don't write it down because I think if it takes writing down for you to remember it, that's not going to get you through a year. And so I tend to just leave those. And what I tend to find with the ones that I've ended up committing to is that flypaper mode switches on and other ideas will start to, to stick to them. A character or a fuzzy idea of a character will wander in from someone and say, you know, that idea that you had, I could be part of that. Or I'll go a place and think, ah, this is the kind of place where this kind of thing could happen. Um, and so I, and again, this is just a, deeply personal you know process and probably yeah. wouldn't work for anybody else but it tends to be to me the ideas have to prove themselves to me i don't pick them they they eventually keep they just it's like the man from paula but in reverse they, they just keep knocking at your door saying don't forget about me because i'm your next thing and sometimes sometimes it may take 10 years the, the book i'm writing at the moment i had the first inklings of the idea for it about a decade ago wow. it's never been the next thing that i wanted to do until four months ago when I started the first draft. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a long and winding road at times. And you just have to trust that in the end, you'll get where you want to be. What a process. That's so incredible. Her last question, I must have missed in the research. I'm sure you will get it. And I think uh, maybe it qualifies in the realm of super fan. Um, <laughs> are you still using the same Apple keyboard? <laughs> wow. Okay. No, for a long, long time, I did use the, the same Apple keyboard. And it did almost approach the level of superstition. It, you know, I would keep I would keep changing up the, the 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 CPU and the machine itself. But there was this one keyboard, and it wasn't the very first one that I'd, I'd used. But it was. I'd quite a few short stories had been written on it. Um, uh, only Ford first few books, I think, maybe even as far as Strawman and further. Yeah, it just became the thing. And again, it refers back to what I talked about talked about in terms of barriers earlier. There was no barrier. I knew when my fingers were on there because I can I can type about as fast as I can think on the right keyboard and so it became something of a deal to me that that i still had this keyboard um but then of course usb came along this was an old one of the old what were they called apb buses or something and so and then <laughs> i think i actually got an adapter for a while it was that sort of like no so, but then eventually you have to say you know what it's not the keyboard if it's not the keyboard it's some <laughs> other part of the thing it's not yeah. the keyboard i still have the keyboard um i don't currently have a, a study i'm working on the, the <laughs> living room table at the moment because that's that's sort of working for me but somewhere in the house is that keyboard and yeah that that meant a thing but no i no it's it's you gotta, yeah i mean i must say that you know some of the stuff that i've said in answer to uh, what i must say are very interesting questions and thank you for that it makes it sound <laughs> as though i've got this this whole thing worked out some complicated you know some <laughs> very well worked out a process it's it's been chaotic throughout I, I just i just do what seems to sort of make sense and hope that you know as i say i'll i'll, I'll get no, I, I thoroughly, we're, you know, we're, we're running out of time here. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. It was well, thank really, you. Me really too. fun to uh, just kind of dive into, you know, the mind of, of someone I, I deem successful at, in, in writing. And you've been doing this for quite a while. I mean, I mm. want to give you the opportunity to, I mean, is, is there something that you would kind of send to your fans, a message, anything like that? Well, I, I, purely and simple, you know, thank you for reading because, you know, it goes without saying that without people reading uh, and without kind comments, and uh, you know, I I wouldn't have the freedom and the and the, the luxury to do what I do. Um, you know, I work hard at it, and I hope I hope there's stuff out there which is which is resonant, with, which is worth reading. And also, just to say simply, you know, I, I'm on Twitter. I've got a I've got a website. Um, I'm on Instagram. You know, please get in touch. Please just let me know your thoughts. Ask me any questions you want to know. Why don't you give us your uh, your website and your Twitter, please? Yeah, the the website is um, www.michaelmarshallsmith.com. Okay. And both Twitter and Instagram are at, and it's e m e m e s s. All is one word. So basically, that's M 
S, which is Michael Marshall Smith, done phonetically, so it's E-M-E-M-E-S-S. So, yeah, please get in touch. Um, always happy to hear, always happy to sort of answer any questions. And as I say, you know, thank you for enabling me to do what I do. Yeah, we'll definitely make the website and the link to your Instagram and Twitter available when we put this episode out. Michael, it's been a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much for lending us your time and making the time to to talk to us. Absolute pleasure to say thank you for the questions. Probably the most interesting questions I've ever been asked. So it's been a total pleasure. You guys have been listening to The Human Experience. We have been talking to Mr. Michael Marshall Smith. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will get to you guys next week.